Hi, our guest today is Father William McDonald Murray, better known as Father Mac from Trinity Episcopal Church. Welcome, Father Mac. Welcome. Thank you. Good Welcome. to be here. And we're here today to talk about the humanitarian summit efforts you're doing. So why don't you kind of tell us about what, what it's all about? Well, we started in, uh, it started with my sabbatical, actually, in the summer of 2012. And I was, uh, the middle month of my sabbatical was spent looking at the needs of the community and how we could reach out and support uh, what was happening in the greater Milford area. The result of that was um, an opportunity to talk to a number of the folks that are working in the social service arena and specifically some of the people that were being served, uh, primarily folks that were living in scattered site shelters around the Milford area, looking at what some of the needs were. The needs that we identified as top priority were transportation, interestingly enough, that uh, there was the one major requirement that wasn't being met and uh, most of the folks that we talked to did not have cars and so to get anywhere was next to impossible. And so uh, we started with a group of folks saying, how do we uh, solve this problem? And we pulled together uh, in, it actually took a couple of years, but we pulled together in, the, in May of 2014, folks from the political arena, the police, the, uh, the churches, the faith community, the business community. Hospital. And, uh, hospital and uh, all came together to talk about what are some of the needs and the, out of that we prioritized basically four needs that uh, we thought we could address. The first being transportation, the second being food security, uh, how to provide appropriate food for people in need, uh, the third being elder care, uh, how do we support those who are alone and living in our community, and the fourth looking at how we can support uh, resource information availability and uh, the good news about that was we had uh, both uh, uh, Representative Fernandez and uh, at the time Senator Moore and their offices helped put together the, the, the first draft of a resource guide which is now on the web and available and we're looking at expanding. Yeah, the, the dilemma is with the, with the web, lots of these people don't have access to the web, so there has to be some other mechanism to but get the, that information out. the group that uh, Ellen Friedman was talking about in our last show was actually working on that. Yeah, Correct. that's actually a, an, out, an outflow of the, right. of the work that the summit's doing is the work that we're doing with Chana. We're actually right. uh, integrating the, both of those efforts, both yeah. in transportation and in resource availability. And, and, and our guest, the show after you, is Harold Rhodes. So we, we got the so transportation, we'll talk transportation. So, so we're, do, we're down to the food issues, I think. Well, well yeah. the good news about transportation the was elderly. that we actually got, we got started looking at how do we make this happen. And, and it was in 2012, uh, that, that summer, when I was on yeah. sabbatical, we were meeting with the uh, Metro West Regional Transit Authority and uh, uh, Representative Fernandez, and at the time, the town manager uh, for Milford, uh, and we were meeting with the, the Metro West Regional Transit Authority board to talk about some of the mechanisms for getting a, right. a test run going here. And then when Harold came on board uh, as... Yeah. And uh, he's jumped right and, into the fray. He really what's, has. What's funny on transportation is it's cut across not just your efforts, the Chinaz efforts and other efforts, it's come up over and over again in all of the things I cover as the single biggest factor preventing things from happening. It is, it is from the perspective of the people that are without, it is the number one priority. Uh, because there is no other way to get around in this area. If you need right. to get to the hospital, I mean, car. one of the things we were finding is that, that uh, particularly folks that are living in poverty uh, are, and they don't have transportation and they're finding that they in order to buy food, they end up going to one of the fast food places right. or one of the, the convenience stores. They don't have the ability to get up to, to Fortune Boulevard or to, right. you know, to, to any of the stores, the, the large supermarkets. And so one of the things we started to do was to, we were fortunate that uh, Bethany uh, offered us some of their vans and we were running van service from uh, downtown Milford to Market Basket and being able to get people to go and buy food economically 
uh, and get the right kind of food. That they and needed. get the right kind of food. That's one of the things that Ellen was Ellen is focused on also. It has, it has to be nutritious because so many food. people are, mm -hmm. are, you know, if, if you wind up living at Tedeschi's or at the uh, McDonald's on 140. Or 7-Eleven. Yeah, it's tough. Or 7-Eleven. You're not, you're not getting a balanced diet. You're not. And that's one of the, the other benefits that's come out is over the last, you know, it, it, we're, we're about to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the uh, Sunday night food program at the Uni Unitarian Universalist Church. That's coming up in May. Yep. And that's sort of the grandfather of feeding programs in this area. From that, we've developed a number of other programs. So now we have, there's food that's available, well um, developed, um, nutritious meals, right. uh, hot meals that are available at the end of the month almost every day and then every every Sunday and every Friday uh, throughout town. So yeah, we're- I, I was gonna say, I don't think people who don't have a need have any idea the size of the problem in Milford? Oh gosh, I mean, if you take last month, uh, the, at Trinity, we're serving meals the last three days of the month. Right. Uh, we served about 250 people, including children. I know the Unitarian uh, Church is packed when they do it. Right. Um, this last month, I mean, 250 I know, folks, I, I, a lot I of folks. I think people just don't have an idea. If, if you don't need it, you don't understand there's a problem. Well, I mean, it goes, it goes beyond that. We have issues in, in the community of poverty, which people seem to walk around or not, they just don't understand that exists. Well, and that was, it was actually an article in the town crier uh, when I was asked the question, what can we do to, to improve the Milford community? Uh, it was uh, one of those, you yeah, know, right. ask three or four people. Uh, and my experience had been, uh, an experience of going to town hall, looking for support, help, um, and wandering around and not really being able to find anyone to, to, to answer my questions. When I went to the desk that said, pay your parking tickets here, and the two young ladies that were there, I asked them, you know, what, where can I go for, uh, for food or for shelter? And they said, oh, well, we don't really know. And, but the town manager at the time was now gone, but he came out and said, uh, well, you know, well, I'd send you over to Winter Haven the shelter. And I said, Winter Haven, that's the one that closed two years ago. And he goes, oh, oh, it's closed. Um, well, you know, then I'll send you to the, a church or the, or the Salvation Army. And I said, well, that would be great, except, you know, how do we get there? You can't get, can there. get, can I get yeah. there from here? Right. Uh, so it's, it was a difficult, uh, a difficult conversation, but then he asked who I was and I explained what I was doing and why I was, uh, I was inquiring. And that's another reason that we said we really need to get some support because there is a large contingent of, I mean, people aren't aware that we've got more than 30 families that are living in this area that are, that are in, in shelter. Right, and, and beyond that is, and this has been discussed at the meetings, uh, getting the information out, not just that, but we talked about a phone number, one number that somebody could call because there are so many resources, but you have to go to so many different spots to figure out what those resources are. And that was the fourth priority. I mentioned the, the other three, food security, elder care, and, and transportation. The fourth was in, in, in providing the resource information. Where and, to go. And, and where do you go? How do you get it? And that's one of the goals of, of this group at this point. And it's, it, it matches what the Chana is also trying to do which is to make sure that access is available and that we have that information available spread throughout the community. And, both and continually updated. It, because it changes on a Yeah, it on changes a, on a regular basis. On a regular basis. Which is one of the possibilities, you know, where we've also gotten engaged with the Mass 211 community. Right. Uh, because Mass 211 does provide that resource and they have a mechanism for continually updating and it's by phone as well as on the web. And uh, so those are possibilities. Uh, the the only problem with that is uh, it's primarily English and Spanish, and we have other language needs in Milford right now. And, and that's one of the things we're doing with Access and with the resource guide is looking at, at Arabic, uh, Portuguese, uh, Quechuan. Um, However you pronounce that word. But yeah. And you know, so um, each, you know, the, the, the various, but now but one of the issues about Quechua is that it's not a, a written language necessarily, it's um, a spoken language. Right. Where, where are you in the effort? If, if transportation and the, uh, for want of a better term, access guide mm -hmm. is sort of now being subsumed in the, 
the Chana fold. It's actually being done in both. I mean, because in the, both. Yeah. Because the Chana, the Chana is taking like the the resource guide that's been developed so far, that's out on the web at this point uh, under Milford Area Resources right. dot org, in is using uh, that for basis, but going forward. Right. Exactly. Uh, but, but where are you on the other efforts, the, the taking care of the uh, elderly and especially the, the food issues? Food security, uh, rates. what's happening right now is we are uh, working with the various churches and uh, the, the uh, business community and looking at how can we uh, continue to provide um, the food that's necessary in this community. The, the, the primary uh, project that's happening at the moment is looking at how do we provide food for kids in the summer. Uh, so that's that, become a critical, that's a priority issue. Because the they, get a, they get uh, through the uh, school lunch program, they get a, a breakfast during and the, lunch. During, during the school, the school year. year. But then there's the roughly three months where they're not. Last night was the first of uh, the, the subcommittee that's working on the summer feeding program met last night and that had their first, their first gathering. They're, they're trying to scope out the size of the problem and, and how, uh, what the opportunity is and how we're gonna, how we're gonna satisfy that need. Um, they're planning to meet again in a week, so the, uh, the goal is to have something in place by the time school gets out. You know, the at the last meeting, that was the priority issue. It is the priority issue. Yes, that's the yeah. priority issue for the, for the, for summit, the summit group. group. Group and then the second issue is uh, with el elder care. You right, el elder care. Right. Our I elder care. Say, is it the talk of you forming your own nonprofit charity? Did I hear that, that a five hundred one three C group that unites everybody? A five hundred one C three is in the process of being developed. We okay. actually th that's the another subcommittee of the group that okay. has gotten together has put together the draft of a of a. Um, um, set of bylaws and, and all of the legal paperwork that has to happen. Uh, to, to get the 501c3 status in the state is a whole lot easier and faster than and it is to get it federal yeah. federally. Federal government takes, well, but, and the, even the federal government is, is easy if you have no employees. Right. Once you add employees, then it becomes then it becomes a whole other okay. issue. That's anyway. Let's go back. Let's but go we're back in the process of doing that as well. So okay. that's. I, I didn't mean to cut you off on beginning the talk on the elderly. I just wanted to get that on the table. That that's being the done. elder care issue is one that we're working with uh, the high school, uh, some of the high school groups. Uh, we've got one of our members, um, Steve, uh, is, right. is works with the high school. Well, well I, know, I know. For example, the National Honor Society kids will shovel snow for any senior that can't but if they know who to ask. What we're looking at, well, we're, we're, we're looking at building the list, first of all, right. and working with the senior center. And the issue, and this is one of the things that the, our police um, presence uh, at, the, at our <coughs> summit meetings talks about, is that we actually have situations in this town <coughs> where on multiple occasions during a week, the police need to go or are called to homes yes. to do wellness checks. And in the course of doing those wellness checks, they find that someone potentially has died or that they have, uh, they have uh, collapsed and have been lying uh, on the floor for several days. That's unacceptable, <laughs> simply unacceptable. And so what we're doing is looking at how can we uh, set up a, a, a system where, and working with the high school is, a, is, uh, is one step, of making sure that there's somebody that, that you get a call each day, you at least a, a get a phone call, and then potentially uh, you get a visit once a week, or you know. Well, what's what's happened is is that um, Rotary, when when Father Mac talks about business community, Rotary brings that yeah. that that yep. piece of the puzzle to the game, well, and we have a Rotaract which is involved in the high school. Okay, but does does the senior center's outreach person get involved in that too? We're in communication with the senior center, but I, you know, the answer is um, the problem seems to be bigger than what the senior center can handle at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the case. It's it goes beyond the senior center. Um, yeah. Now, who is, there's a member that comes to the that she represents. She represents to some extent the senior center or seniors, and she's asking questions. Right. Um, so that 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 function is at the, the table. Uh, either. Uh, you have John O'Laughlin, you have uh, Mrs. DeVita. I can't remember the outreach worker's name, and of course, Sue Clark is the director. Mm -hmm. um, or the, the head people there. And, uh, right, my, uh, right. 
it is it is a, it is a problem that's not usually noticed. I think there's well, it's a, a hidden problem. It, uh, well, I, I think also there's a mis. I, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but maybe people misjudge the problem or characterize the people going, mischaracterize the people going, as sort of people looking for uh, you know uh, a free handout. Going, going to to a meal program or in need of something, whereas. I actually know some of the people who are homeless, mm -hmm. and in one case, it's a woman who uh, they lost their house through a divorce. Oh my and gosh! And she was laid off about a month after that. No, I think for me, a, a, a wonderful learning experience. I mean, I, yeah. that that month of the sabbatical when I was working in the community, I I worked with Smock. Yeah. Um, I actually had office space down in in Framingham with them, so I could work in both the the family section as well right. as the single uh, section. But in, the, in working with the family side, I came out and worked with the local caseworker uh, and with permission of the families, went each morning to visit with uh, several families as she went from, yeah. from family to family. The learning experience of just talking and, and finding, hearing the stories, because there's, there's no, there's no uh, shame or fault in, 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 this, in homelessness. It's, it simply is a, a circumstances that have it just Caught happens. Up. It just happens, and and that the, the people were wonderful that I had the opportunity to meet and talk to, and just to hear what some of the needs were and so, what what their circumstances were, was an eye opener. I mean, it, with the economy the way it was, you know, in the last decade, to me, all it takes is being, uh, you know, uh, maxed out on debt, uh, or living right up to your salary, uh, a loss of a job, right. and the next thing you know, the, the house goes, and you're, you're sitting there going, now what do I do? I mean, I think th the issues that we're contending with are ones that th it takes volunteers. It takes right. people to step up and say that they want to, to, to make a difference and do something about it. The, the, the food problem, uh, the feeding programs that we have, we were fortunate. You know, I, I, my sense is that you can't make a program work unless you've got people that have passion. Right, and That's you exactly need the case. you need those passionate people, and I've, you know, I, I happen to have a, a guy at, at Trinity who came to me, you know, three or four years ago and said, I I love to cook for large groups of people, and I want to be able to do something like that. And I said, Well, why don't we go over to the Unitarian Church first? Let's see what they're doing. Let's see how we can can leverage off of their program. Right. And we did, and and we actually set up the uh, the meal program that we were doing at the Unitarian Church uh, for that first year because it made sense. That's where people, right. knew, they knew where it was. Right. They just went through the, behind the Dunkin' Donut when it was a Dunkin' Donut. And, and now it's I'm now hoping with laundromat. coordination, they don't overlap, but they're on separate days and times of the well, month. Well, and, and part of that is because the, uh, as the Unitarian Church needed to find some other revenue sources, they started a daycare, and the right. daycare then took over the week time, uh, the weekday right. uh, program. So we had to move, and we moved to Trinity. But the good news about that was that uh, once we started advertising a little bit, we increased the number of people coming. So now we're seeing 60 to 90 people coming for every meal. And I'm talking about children. And, and these are, you know, the good news about the program is it's not just for, you know, people that are um, potentially, what's the right word for hungry? I mean, you know, that, that, that are going without food. It's for anybody that, that wants to come and simply have a, Socialize a social over place to meal. be. Let's because and, one of the other issues is that's very important to be able to socialize well, and well, talk to the people. You being a Midwesterner by birth, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the good old concept, which is big down south of the community church related, but the community supper. Uh, what I, I oh yeah, I, I, for, for years in my previous career, I spent years traveling and uh, by myself. And I would go uh, on many, many occasions to restaurants that actually served a com had a community table. And I'd, I love that, you know, to be able to go and sit down with a group of people. But the, the key for the meals that we're doing now, when we started the meal program, we would find, you know, we have a, a large space upstairs where, we're, where we do our serving in the parish hall. And we'd find that people would be scattered around sitting at their own table. So there might be 12 tables set up and everybody would go and sit at their own. Now, people show up at 3 o'clock. They come, they save seats for each other, they, they, they get together, they talk, they, we start serving at 4.30, uh, we're finished serving at 6, and we have to say, hey, can you guys, it's ready time to go and now, I, I, I Don't, I, because I, I, it's a yeah. social event. And I wouldn't now. underestimate that. I, uh, I'll tell you an, an honest story. I went to a Girl Scout um, pancake breakfast in Menden, where I live, about a month ago. 
and just sat down at the table with two people I never met before, found out we have similar things in common. They were Girl Scout leaders. I'm a retired Boy Scout leader. And uh, we're socially friends now. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're going and doing things together. Mm -hmm. Never met them before that. Right. So there's a great a atmosphere to that. Well, yeah. it's, uh, the, the, the thing that I think is most significant is it's not just a, 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 a chew and screw, you know, take off situation. That's, I heard, just heard this recently. And, you know, it's a bunch of people get together. And the nice thing about your facility, the way you do it, is you serve the meals to the people. So it's, it's truly like a restaurant it environment. Is. It is. So people can sit down and relax and be served a meal. And the people that serve the meal communicate with the people that are, that are sitting there Absolutely. eating. Absolutely. And, and, and that's part of our goal together. is to make it, to make it uh, a pleasant evening. Right. As opposed to, you know, uh, to like, yeah, and, and, and I, I don't do, um, I don't get up and, 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 and talk at them. You know, right. it's not, that's not, I, I, I'll go and sit at a table and chat, right. you know, but it's, uh, I'm there, I'm so there as simply a, a. Somebody that serves and somebody to somebody just communicate serves. with. Yeah. And that's the thing that I, I noticed that was really kind of, kind of interesting, is everybody's in good spirits, everybody's having fun, they're communicating. Uh, I know the night that, that we went there and served, my wife spent a great deal of time just talking to people, just, you know, just yeah. talking to people. That and was great, great. And that's it. The, the good news is that volunteers want to come and want to help out and you know we've got everything from from young people who you know serve the drinks and the, the uh, and, and take care of the tables to uh, you know to our our most senior citizens that that yeah uh, absolutely are, are there just to, to to help and to have that conversation and so, it's well run it's well organized it's yeah. good food it's not just you know. And each of the programs, I mean, that's, so we, you know, we do the, we do this last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Sacred Heart does the last Saturday of every, of every month, uh, the Blessing Barn does a lunch every Friday, the um, St. Mary's does a, a meal on, on uh, the second Tuesday of the month, so there's meals that are happening throughout the month. Right. Yeah. And, and we'd love to see more, we'd love to see more, but it, part of that is it takes Volunteers. Sustainability is a real question because once you start that, you don't want to stop. You don't want to stop. So once you're committed to that, it's just sustainability is a critical, That's a critical right. issue. That's right. Um, Rotary had we had originally said, "Gee, what's the best way we can get engaged?" And as as time went on, we came to the realization that maybe we need to sit down and understand the needs before we jump in the fray. Right. And so that's what we're doing now. And and. Our view are, has changed significantly in what the needs are. Mm -hmm. The opposite is, of the federal government. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, let's let's don't go. No, down but there. I think it's important to to be able to look at how can you sustain a program like this, and how can you make sure that, in the long run, you know, people will be fed, uh, and and they and they know when they show up, it's going to be there because and they know it's going to be good food. Right. That's. That's probably more important than anything else because people, you know, people, if they're going to go and, do that, they want to have some And I would food. also add that if you're amongst a community of people that no one knows who's there for absolute need mm -hmm. versus who's there for a social experience. Yeah. Because one of, one of the things I dislike, and, and I'm, I'm not making this as a slur on the food pantry on Exchange Street, but on the nights they distribute food, they line up the street, and everyone knows who's there waiting for food. My sense, you know, and my office is immediately across yes. the street from, from the pantry. And I talk about this a bit in the sense that to, to line up at 3 o'clock on a pouring rain or yeah. snowing or freezing day and standing outside, it's a, it's a tough situation because there's a sense that, you know, I, I need, well, one, I mean, it's really twofold. One, there's, there is some social aspect to it. Yes. There's some social aspect to it. But there's also a sense of, you know, what happens if, if there's not enough? But you there's know. also the aspect. But there's always it, enough. There's always enough. The That's interesting it. part about people but show up and line up to, so they don't miss anything, but, the, but they never yeah. run out. The aspect that bothers out. me is if I were in that situation, I'd probably be embarrassed by it. I'm not embarrassed to take help, but I'd be embarrassed by having to stand out in a line for two hours. Yeah. Well, and we've looked a at... And, and I'm not doing this to criticize the operation because it's a wonderful place. No, 
And, and I think, uh, you know, I've But been you're a, sort of identified in public as those people. We, we've actually had some conversations about some possibilities of ways to, to provide, one, a place to go inside. Right. Um, the Methodist Church has offered to have, um, you know, like soup and, and, uh, and sandwiches uh, inside or games for the kids or other things going on. But there's a, there's a question there of how do you maintain your, your place in line? And, and you know, is it, would it be possible for them to, to hand out numbers or something? You know, there's a, there's, and, and so talking to the food pantry board and yeah. looking at how do, you know, what are the possibilities to make that work? Because it is, it is tough, especially you know, when the, the weather's foul. When the weather's foul, it's, it's yeah. very difficult. Well, I could, ju I could just see how complicated it would be for the food pantry to call up to the church and say, okay, we're now taking numbers 15 through 20. <laughs> well, no, and once the doors open, it's, it, things know. run very, very quickly. You know, so 6 yeah. o'clock, 6 o'clock, you know, then, uh, you know, it, it, people get processed through very, very rapidly. And that, that is an all-volunteer operation. Yes, too. it is. 100% volunteer. So, I mean, I don't think people realize how many volunteers it takes to get something like all these things coordinated and, and done well, I mean, and the sustained. Good, the good news is for each of the programs, like our meal programs, like the food pantry, and the food pantry is a good example where they have a wonderful dedicated group of people who have, yes. you know, they're to, to try and break into <coughs> the sorting room and, and the bagging room, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge because there's, there's, a, there's wonderful groups of people that, that right. they love to work together and they've been doing it for a long time. They take ownership in, in that process. Absolutely. And which, is a, which, is a, which makes it sustainable. Absolutely. Um, and that's, and I, I don't think people really, the, the majority of people don't really understand two things. First thing is how many people it takes to volunteer to make these operations work properly and they never see behind that facade. They don't see the people that are doing that work, the good work. There's, you don't see advertisements, you know, 16 people by name who work here and 15 right. work. There's but I, but I think one of the things that happens, though, and, and this is the part that's, it's the magic part of the mission work and, uh, and right. the, this kind of support, is that once you do it, once you've had the opportunity to be the person that serves at the table, to be the person that, that bags the, the food that's going out the door, that, that does the check-ins, that, that, uh, that serves the, the, the drink, that cleans the table. Once you have the opportunity to do that and, and just to have, see the smile on that child's face. It's very fulfilling. Adult, you'll come back, right. you'll come back. It's very, um, it's very fulfilling and I think also uh, it also demonstrates to s somebody who was brought up in a very religious household the concept of I am my brother's keeper. Yeah. That you do have a duty to your fellow person to well, help out. We, we call it missionary work. I mean, we are all God's missionaries, you know, and, and we, yeah. are the, we are called to be the people that, that make this happen. I mean, yeah. it's, in my tradition, it's, you know, it, it's said you love the Lord your God and you love your neighbor as yourself. yourself. And loving your neighbor means getting out there and doing those things. So. Yeah.